I get to like go from something in my head, put it down on paper, be part of the process while it gets built and then actually see people use it. It's a tremendous gift that resonates deeply to understanding what a life is all about. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to Lionel Ohayan. Lionel is the founder and CEO of iCrave, a New York City-based innovation and design studio that reimagines built and digital environments for award-winning hospitality, airport, healthcare, and workplace projects across the globe. A recent project you've most definitely heard of is the immersive and paradigm-shifting live entertainment venue, The Las Vegas Sphere. It truly does change the game in terms of the concert-going experience. Lionel studied architecture at the University of Waterloo in Canada before moving to New York City, and in 2002, founded iCrave as a design-build startup. It first made a name with projects like STK, a popular nightclub in the meatpacking district, which quickly led to hotels, cruise ships, and airports, and reinventing the traveler experience. Now, 22 years in, iCrave is leading the charge in understanding how our digital and physical worlds collide across industries and integrating their expertise in strategy, branding, experience design, interior design, lighting design, and digital design, along with deep research into human experience for projects like creating patient-centric ecosystems for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and St. Jude Family Commons and 53, a restaurant next to MoMA that extends the art experience to dining. The Las Vegas sphere, as Lionel has described it, is limitless and otherworldly. Qualities of potential that you can hear in his words, too. Here's Lionel. My name is Lionel O'Han. I currently work in Miami and New York. I'm an architect by training. I work in the space of solving problems using design thinking. And most of our work is in the space where people connect in real life. Our thesis has been is about understanding how our physical and virtual lives are really converging into one broad experience base. So we're navigating that new kind of experience map, if you will, to understand how we engage with each other socially, emotionally, and how we really look at our world as a place where we're converging from all types of encounters. So for me, the, what really inspires me is understanding the world we live in and what I call the pointy end of the pencil of architecture, which is the emotive side of what it means to be in place, in space, creating a world that's ever-changing. And I think for us and me specifically, that search has brought us to a world where there are a lot of unknowns, right? There's a lot for the first time in many parts of human evolution, we're struggling with understanding, well, what world do we live in, right? Which parts of it are real, which parts of it are not? And I think people my age generally think that the whole new virtual world is not real, but we could certainly point to the fact that there are people are having real human experiences in completely artificial places. And in understanding that, we understand that those places need to be thought through. They need to be conceived and we need to understand why they are the way they are and how they impact our lives in this physical world. That is impressive and psychologically laden, maybe even fraught territory at times, but also a very exciting frontier. And something I think about when you talk about people our age, are we similar age? Are we both Gen X? Yeah, Gen X. Okay. And thinking that that space is not real is that invites a certain sort of disconnection from it. They're not participating in the building of that world. And that's a problem because we need all people building that world that is the world we're all converging into. Well, there's no doubt. And I think we're dismissive of it, right? And we just don't understand the weightiness of what it's doing. I think people are starting to understand the impact of it right? Like mm -hmm. what's happening with our children, what's happening with their happiness and where they seek satisfaction and what meaning is around their lives. And yeah, I've always felt that architecture plays a super important role in the world we live in, right? It's not the buildings we build. It's, it's creating the world we live in. 
It's the spaces we inhabit. It's where our lives take place. Yeah. It's where delight and happiness and joy and grief and all those things take place, right? And we impact that. So someone said to me, well, what agency do you have to design in the metaverse or the virtual world or whatever it is? I was like, well, who has it if not me, right? Like, yeah. like who? tell me who should be uh, designing or conceiving this world. I think in general, architecture as a profession probably since the 1700s when the first engineering school was built in France has been parsing off pieces of its kind of domain, right? Like architecture as a kind of like a, as a part of society, right? Like the part of society that said, we got to build the cities we live in and they need to be good places for people to live. As it got more complex, the world of architecture got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. All of a sudden there was landscape architecture, there was interior design and so on and so on, millions of different disciplines that got clipped off of it until maybe architecture itself, urban planning, all these parts used to be part of an ethos of thinking. Yeah. You know, I think architecture has been gutted, right? It's really just like, well, we need somebody to sign off on the stuff and design cool buildings. And I think like I, I'm being a little bit extreme, but it's kind of like if you look at the progression of how architects have lost control over the narrative of the world we build, right? The part of society that's paid for it is the the health of our cities, mm-hmm. right? That's really the issue is that there's no kind of overarching vision that has authority over understanding what that world can be. And, and it does require new, new types of thinking and new types of experts to sort of solve for it. But it needs to live under some sort of house, which it doesn't right now. And I think like for me, that's like, the most interesting space right now because whether I code in some software or not, that's not really the question. The question is, what is that world going to be about? I do think over the last several generations, we've separated into these specialties. And now we're starting to realize that when we're all siloed off, we're not benefiting from shared knowledge. We're not benefiting from the cross-pollination. And we're also not thinking about things holistically, as you pointed out. And so the concept of you building a house where all this can live under one roof in order to have a more holistic sort of genesis of project and conceptual thinking is something that I feel is really important. As an educator, I feel that's really important. And I'm excited to to hear you talk about bringing that together because it's you're in a space where that's difficult. You're sort of going against the grain by doing that. And at the same time, it's wholly necessary. So Cheers to you. Before we get deeply into what you're doing right now, I'd love to understand how you got to be so interested in this. And to do that, I really love to understand where you grew up and what your family dynamic was and what kinds of things interested you as a kid. And I know you've always wanted to be an architect. Where did that grow from? It's an interesting question. It's funny because I have so many inputs as a as a child that I'm born into a Jewish family who emigrated from Morocco to Canada, pregnant with me. Mm. But I was born in Canada and grew up in Canada. But most of my family lived somewhere between Spain, France, and Israel. Okay. My professional career really took off in New York for 29 years, and now I live in Miami. But so there's so many sort of inputs that are are formative. And when I look back and I think about what are the, the important things that gave me the what I believe to be a breadth of thinking, mm-hmm. right? Like my ability to have like synthesize a lot of different inputs and ideas and, and understand them. Part of that for me is having gone to Hebrew school and learning how to read from left to right and right to left and understanding like concepts that are pretty complex around Torah studies at the same time I was like a very in-depth art student, right? So, and Torah studies, incredibly intellectual, right? It's incredibly kind of deep thinking and opening doors that continue to open. And and so between that and and really being involved in language learning, being in a French home, spending my summers in Europe, and then coming back to North America, I feel like I was like, I was gifted with all these amazing opportunities to see different things and see the world from different points of view. And I think that that is something that I think a lot about with my own kids is about like how broad, what's the breadth of experience that I can offer them 
right? So they don't live siloed in, in, in one world of thinking. So that to me has been a critical piece of like understanding what it is that I understand and what my point of view is, right? Because it's not singular. Yeah. Having a lot of inputs and understanding what your point of view is, but it also sounds to me like you were comfortable with complexity from a young age and also comfortable translating across worlds, translating across physical space into, let's say, written or artistic space. And that communication, I'm wondering how that skill set that you were exposed to and probably developed from early on, I wonder how that informed your, let's say, teenage years and the rest of your growth. It's interesting because, you know, I was, um, I went to a public high school. I begged my parents to let me leave Hebrew school and go to a public school. So we, we cut a deal and I got out, which was interesting. But it was also really another piece of this puzzle where I, all of a sudden I was like exposed to a whole breadth of types of things that you didn't always get in a private school. I remember that I, I, I sort of crossed a lot of different groups of friends. Like I had friends who were, you know, in the art program. Right. And then I had my jock friends. And then, you know, kind of like the party and mess around. I had party friends. And there's one time my mom threw a, a surprise birthday for me, invited all these different friends that were all in my basement when I got down there. And I was kind of, I was a little bit horrified, right? Because I was like, <laughs> oh my God, how am I going to bridge all these different groups who really don't talk to each other? This, they don't stay in the same part of the school. And I remember that specifically because I remember thinking about the fact that I, seeing myself in this event as somebody who had bridged all these groups who would not talk to each other at school, but somehow my family knew that I was friends with these different groups and just figured, well, let's invite the people that are as friends. And it was a very cross-cultural kind of like bridging. I was kind of like bridging people. Yeah. Funny. It was just a silly thing, but it stuck with me for a long time. And it's something that I think about a lot about what it is what you need to do, right? Like how do you get big ideas to happen? How do you bring people together, right? How do you actually find yourself comfortable not only seeing one way or, or understanding the world through a lens that's formed by a group of people, which I guess today more than ever in these echo chambers we create, right? Like you, you just find the people who think like you do. You go into a group on some virtual community and you just stay there, right? And, and it's very dangerous. Yeah, that is very dangerous. And I love that you shared that story. I, mean, I was also one of those people who had friend groups that didn't mesh at school, but I loved them all the same. And they were all interesting for a number of reasons, but they, for whatever reason, didn't mesh. I'm thinking about you at this surprise birthday party with all your different friend groups. And this also sounds like the start of like a hospitality muscle really being formed in terms of making that space now a space where all of these different people feel comfortable together. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, like I grew up in a French Moroccan home, right. And, and Moroccan culture is around the world consider, you know, this is about receiving, it's about hospitality, right. And Arabic culture, like our, even though I'm Jewish, our traditions are Arabic. You know, if you went to a wedding for me or my brothers or sister, you'd see all these Arabic traditions and, dressing up and, and eating certain foods that are clearly Moroccan culture. But at the core of it, we grew up in a family that was constantly receiving people, hosting events, creating these moments of like family and holidays together. Mm. So I grew up in a house where it was like kind of like pouring tea and bringing dessert, bringing nuts and fruit after dessert. Like this is constant kind of like ebb and flow. So I learned that through my extended family, spending summers in Spain with like groups. And, and I tell clients that a lot. And I'm like, look, I can gild your venue in gold, mm -hmm. right? But if you have a restaurant, you don't know how to receive people. You don't understand the nature of like why you should do it more this way or that way. There's nothing that, that anyone's going to be able to do for you until you get that right, right? You get the, you understand the experience. You understand what it means to receive somebody in your house. And a lot of what iCrave has done has really been about breaking open this experience. What is the experience of receiving somebody in your home? And so certainly I think that I was completely predisposed for thinking about, even if it was going to be architecture, which I always wanted to be, it was always going to be in this hospitality side. Interesting. 
I mean, I know you cut a deal with your parents to go to public school. Was that evidence of a rebellious streak or was that just a, an adventurous side who needed a different experience? I'm, I'm trying to understand if you went through the normal awkwardness that most teenagers did or if you were just like already on your path and very driven. I would say I was more kind of like on my path, right? Like I'd never strayed from this idea that I was going to be an architect. If you met my third grade teacher and you said, hey, I, I met one of your students they would ask you, did he become an architect? Okay. Not that I wasn't awkward. I'm sure I was, but I was good in my skin. I was very comfortable in my skin. I just, you know, I grew up in a very multicultural neighborhood. Canada in, in general is very multicultural. I had lots of friends from my street, from my neighborhood who weren't Jewish. And I just wanted to just like do something different. You know, I was really interested in art and I wanted to like, I wanted to like evolve more. Have you always been proactive about your own evolution? Always. I sometimes tell people that my superpower is my ability to stand next to my ego and have that conversation, you know? It's like you have to be able to know who you are and what your core is, and you have to know what your ego is when you're kind of reacting to that. If you can sort of literally have an out-of-body experience and understand those two things, you can get some clarity about where you need to be. Were you always so conscious of your ego and your your sense of self-assuredness and composure? Look, you know, architecture school was a I went to I went to the University of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. It was a very very difficult program to get into. I was very competitive, right? The first year design award was like a big deal and I knew I I was going to do whatever it took to win the first year design award. I say all this because after I got the award, I just kind of was like, all right, like you got like you got the award. Congratulations. Like, what did you give up to get the award? And give up a lot. You know, it was like hardcore. You went to RISD, like it was hardcore, competitive. You never get an A at, at University of Waterloo. So to actually get there and get one felt like you climbed a mountain. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that my friends who were just normal people who went to normal universities in first year were partying and having a great time and all sorts of other stories that they were doing, which I didn't get any of, right? I was just like working for a year. And so I kind of came back in second year and I kind of was like, yeah, whatever, you know, like I'm just going to do my thing. At first, what it did for me is like a professor would be like, you know what, Lionel, don't even come to class. You're just, you're good at what you do. But if you're just coming here to, to, to mail it in, don't waste your time. Oh. Which was like a byproduct of me pulling back too far. Okay. And the other part of the byproduct was that I, when I did lean back in, I leaned back in to search for the things that interested me. Yes, 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 yes. So I wasn't like trying to package the perfect project to get the mark. I just had some things that I wanted to explore. Yep. Right? And I just spent the next five years exploring things that were important to me without this kind of anxiety like, oh my God, am I going to get recognition? Am I going to get the grade or whatever? And so a lot of times my projects weren't finished. But the ideas that they were grappling with were a lot bigger than I would have taken on because I was worried to finish it on time or whatnot. And I was comfortable with that. I was like, I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is to this, but this is where I am. This is where I'm going. That is such an important place to be. You have the benefit, the privilege of education. You have the, the faculty and the expertise and the facilities. And to get to that place where you're not just trying to work the system, but you're actually deploying it to evolve your own knowledge in the direction that you need it to go is the most empowered place, I think, to be in education. But not everybody gets there as quickly as you did. So that's a pretty powerful realization. It makes me think that you might be a nonlinear thinker. <laughs> like, is your traditional pattern to sort of zoom in and zoom out almost like aerial style? Yeah, I'm... I'm I'm the kind of person who will take an approach to a project and then take the absolute opposite side of what I just brought on, right? Just to like cha challenge it. Yeah. You used to do that in high school with essays, you know, be like, you'd have like a subject matter in English and you have to go write an essay on it. Well, the whole time you're discussing the subject in class, you have a position vocally as you discuss it with your class. And then you turn in a paper that was the opposite on what you'd been speaking about. That's how you have to sort of like, think through ideas back and forth and challenge them and challenge them. Exactly. And you have to interrogate your own thinking. I, I think, 
you know, one of the strengths of, of what we've been able to create is just to challenge our ideas, you know, and just not wrap it in a package and make it beautiful. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to see because I think like at iCrave in general, the people who work there and who have been there for a long time and, and people, alumni who have left, have carried that kind of like process forward. It really is my greatest joy to see. Yeah, I bet you are the University of iCrave. <laughs> and I'm thinking for a firm such as yours to continually be at that sort of frontier edge. So you are not delivering what people think they want. You are showing people what they could want and then helping them get there. Does that sound accurate? That's great, by the way. I'm going to make sure I write that down. <laughs> But that's a skill and that's diplomacy and tact and communication as well, because you have to help people see your vision in order to get them on board, especially if they're collaborators or clients or in some way working on this with you. Bringing people along seems like maybe one of your superpowers. Well, I always tell people in the studio that if you did your job right, the client will tell his friends that he designed it. You were just there. It's like the, all everything was their idea. Mm hmm. Right. It was all their idea. And you just kind of like help push the process along. That is hard to do, but that is how you do good design. Right. You're not imposing your ideas. There are times when we we kind of looked at each other and we said, we should have pushed harder. Like we, we don't have to be, we don't have to acquiesce so much. You know what I mean? You're always towing that line, right? Where you're not jamming something down someone's throat. Our mantra has been ideas for the brave. And the brave are not us. The brave are our clients. And we I could point to every project and tell you that's a good project because I, I had a brave client. I mean, they're just letting me come up with ideas and they're saying, yeah, let's do it, right? Yeah. But usually they're, the good ones are ideas that have not been done yet. So it takes a lot of courage as a client to just be like, yeah, that's what, let's do that. How do you think you summoned the courage to go from architecture graduate all the way through to founding iCrave. I know you had a chapter of work before that where you did a lot of design build. So I think that I was predisposed to work for myself. I think that just was part of my DNA, right? And at the University of Waterloo, we were in a co-op program, right? So you're at school, then you went to work, then you went to school and you went to work. So by the time I graduated architecture school and done the whole year in Rome, there was another two and a half years where you actually were working in architects' offices. I'd worked for architects in Paris and Montreal and Toronto, all over the place. And along the way, you got to learn what the world of being an architect is like inside an office. And so what that did is it allowed us, when we went back to school, not to ever be taught anything about, like, how do you make a drawing, like any of that stuff you learned at work. Mm. And at school, you were just all creativity, it was pure ideas, which was perfect for me. It's a nice model. What I also got to learn was that I never worked for an architect who was happy, ever. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> and I'd never heard of somebody who had worked for a happy architect. They're just they're just, just miserable. Like, it's just like either they were complaining that they weren't making enough money for the work that they did, or they weren't able to do the creative projects they always wanted to do. Yeah. They were like frustrated people. Even the incredible architects, they just were like, they didn't get to control the idea process. And so it, it became very clear to me that if I was going to do this, I was going to have to do it the way I thought it should be done. And so when I finished my thesis in architecture school, one of the professors said to me, your work is very, it's almost theatrical. It's very kind of like, the, the narratives are so strong. It's like, have you ever thought of being a film director? Right. And so not really, but that's actually pretty interesting. So I, you know, as I started poking around on sets and the, the, the director's guild and all that stuff, and I'm thinking that maybe I want to be a chief production designer or something on the film. And so, but then I came back to, you know, I, th there's a whole other narrative here about my father passed away just when I graduated architecture school. So there's like this kind of this real oh. crossroads in my life of like, it really happened literally. You know, I found out the day I finished my thesis, he went to the hospital, he died six weeks later. So it was a very pretentious moment in my life, right? Having finally graduated architecture school and then this happening and then being like, okay, what, why is this all happening together? What are you going to learn from it? And 
what's your next step? So for me, it was this thing where, you know, you wanted to be an architect since you were six. And I can hear my dad saying, like, you're not going to drop it now, right? Like, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. You have to at least give it a chance. And so I said, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it my way. And I, I went back to, like, the beginning of architects and what they did and a little bit about what I was talking about earlier about how architects have been piecing off their position and building worlds. And I was like, you know, architects used to be master builders. They weren't just the guys who drew it. They'd be on the job site and they'd build the thing, you know, like that's how you would do it. And I was like, maybe what I need to do is take control of what I design. So I should think about becoming a master builder, meaning that we do all the design and we build everything. And so that's kind of like, you know, I stayed home because, you know, what I family, what we just gone through and everything. I was like, I stayed home with my mom. I moved back into my mom's house cleared out the basement and started this business, designing and building suburban basements, backyards, decks, fences, you know, like renovations and stuff. I was really successful at it. I was, I was making a lot of money. I paid off my student debt that first year and I was kind of like wow. living at home for free and whatnot. And were you hands-on on the job site too? Like putting boards together and... Yeah. I mean, less and less and less as we become busier and busier and then I'd wake up and all of a sudden there were four people in my basement and then five. And I was like, oh my God, I'm building a company here. Yeah. And then I just was like, it happened very fast. I was like, is, is this where you want to enter the game? Right? Because you could stay here mm -hmm. doing renovations and you could probably, it looks like you could probably build a business to make a lot of money. But for all of the thinking you've done up until now, by then I was probably 25, is this where you want to enter the game? And I, I kind of realized that it wasn't. It was like, I, I need to go for more intellectual, bigger projects, more challenging kind of architectural world. When I got brought to New York, which was just a year later, I was like... And are we talking early 90s? When is this? Yeah, we're talking 95. My father passed away in 94. So 95, 96, 97. Mid 90s. Okay. New York's a tough one for design build. Yeah, when I got here, I, I kind of was running this big production of all these properties that were owned by this single man who needed to be designed and built. And we had the infrastructure around us, so I sort of took on that role. And I learned a lot. We built very complex things, and we had our own kind of shops and our own teams to build it all. So manufacturing became a really important piece of the puzzle for me and understanding how things actually get built. When I left there... I found somebody who had a design build firm doing real projects in New York City. And I went, I, the question at that point was like, are you ready to really go into New York and just be a design build guy on your own? And I wasn't. I just didn't know the lay of the land well enough. And so I met this guy and I started working with him. I really ended up in a suit. You know, I ended up in a suit with a tie on. And about two years into that... <laughs> You say that like it's so not you. <laughs> oh, God. I literally had an epiphany one morning. <laughs> and I was like, I had my head against the mirror in, in the bathroom, right? And I was putting my tie on. <laughs> and I, I literally said to myself, this is, I'm not paraphrasing. I said, choke yourself with that tie. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? I literally had this conversation. I said, you spent your whole life working towards something. And what are you, why are you? Who are you? Like, what are you doing? And that day, I literally quit. Wow. I said, I can't do this anymore. And that's a whole other bunch of reasons. But fundamentally, I was like running around with brokers, real estate brokers, and trying to get deals and commercial interiors and stuff. I was like, well, what are you doing? And at that point, I stopped thinking about should I be in New York? Shouldn't I? I was like, I quit. I was in a one bedroom apartment. I moved my bed into my living room. I bought two doors. At at a hardware store, I turned my bedroom into an office. And I started iCrave and I just said, it'll be what it'll be. Right. And once I got on my path, right, which was then looking for projects that I actually wanted to do. And now, you know, to, to the credit of like having done that job for a couple of years, I knew the brokers and I knew what was going on. Right. I knew where I could slip in. Yeah. And then from there, it was just like gliding into business really that just like flourished really it was hard work but we were getting projects we got into a cycle we had a point of view people knew why they were calling us right yeah so 
what I'm picking up is that you learned valuable information about how the economics of this all works. Valuable information. I mean, you'd been hands-on for a long time. So like the understanding materiality close up, right? Understanding really how stuff gets built helps you become a better designer because you can push the edges of how things get built if you know. If you know how to make it, it's a whole different ballgame, right? Absolutely. So you've started iCrave. You're, you've got this independent streak that's, that's pretty profound. You also have a knack for course correction. And yet you've gotten yourself into situations where you learned the things you needed to learn in order to take the next step. So now I crave when you founded it, you say that things start flowing in and you made quite a name and an impact on New York City, but also for your business in terms of nightclubs, hospitality, restaurants. And this is essentially world building. Like you are a production designer when you're designing these spaces. You are creating a new reality for people to exist in and a narrative in a lot of ways. Your work is still very theatrical and very narrative. So all of this is kind of coming together. And are you still finding your voice? Is your voice still being developed? And how are you getting braver and braver clients? There's always this kind of like self introspection that it's not good enough. Like you're not doing the projects you should be doing. They should be bigger projects. They should be more important projects. Or That's innate in me. I think a lot of people have that where they're, they're not going to be happy with what they've done. They want to think about what they're doing next. Mm-hmm. One of the things that it led to is this voracious appetite for new, for more, right? And this like constant, like sometimes I just kind of open up a an old file of like a portfolio from years ago. And I'm like, how many projects did we actually do? We did a tiny little studio. We did so many projects to a fault, right? Like I think other people, maybe if I had another voice in the room, would have said, nah, we shouldn't do that one. You know what I mean? Okay. It wasn't about making money. It was about a new challenge. You know what I mean? And maybe just trying something different. I think that we had started to land what I would call directional ideas that we were exploring, right? Like, this is in the hospitality nightclub stuff. And nightclubs were a natural evolution. My thesis was, what is the impact of virtual space on our real world? You know, this is like Snow Crasher back in like, you know, this is like 1994. Mm-hmm. It manifests in a theatrical nightlife venue in, in downtown Toronto. And I learned that you had the most license in an area like that to be creative, right? Like you said, it's like a production design. Like, who's going to tell you not to be more creative if it's a nightclub? Right. Especially, that's what they were looking for. They're looking for somebody who can, like, do something really amazing, really cool, really crazy, because that was the currency to get people to come into your nightclub at the time, right? Right. But what we were landing were, like, big ideas. Like, how can one step through the looking glass and relinquish their inhibitions to learn something new about themselves. That's a pretty big idea for a nightclub. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> but those were kind of like, those were like the, the driving principle in all of those nightclubs was like, can I learn something new about myself? And, you know, like we, you might have gotten up on a table and danced in a nightclub on a table. And that could be a life affirming thing that, that you just, you were, you found the confidence to do it or you relinquish your inhibitions in front of, and you just went for it. And there was always this kind of like intellectualization. We always had this like kind of like chip on our shoulder that we came from architecture school and we were doing interiors, right? And we were like, kind of like, how do we turn it into architecture, right? And I think that that was good for the work. And I think that we were forming like this kind of sense about like experience outcomes, emotive outcomes. Mm -hmm. A lot of things we talked about were delight, like moments of delight. Right, which became like a driving principle about how how light affects the way you feel, right, and how we can manipulate, yes, like not just light, but the choreography of how light works, or how you move from one space lit a certain way to another one lit another way, that would create that kind of mode of response we're looking for. Yes, and all of those things also influence like their behavioral cues right. as well. So if you can sort of nudge somebody in a certain direction without physically nudging them. You talked about receiving people into your home before. It's a little bit like that. Like you're inviting somebody into an experience 
with those physical and and light and sensory cues of the space. I'll give you a silly but straightforward example. Like we would uh, understand that when people walk into a bar, they probably have a little bit of anxiety, maybe not a ton, but a little bit, and they may be looking for a friend or they came in alone. There's a whole noise level and social level going on, and you need to find a perch, right? You don't want to be standing there in the middle of the room. You don't know where you should be standing. You like, exactly. how lit is it? Can I go find a, a quiet spot? And so people would, in general, we, we understood people would either find a bar to perch on, mm-hmm. right? Or a side table in a, a lower lit space, or make their way to the bathroom, because that's another reaction where you want to see what's going on in the room. So the easy way to do that is make your way straight to the bathroom and check out the whole room, and make your way back because you found a perch kind of thing, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and so we broke down these kind of very banal things and tried to understand what it meant and how it was going to influence our reaction because we wanted to be good hosts, right? We wanted to like, we wanted you to feel good. You know, we never had people leave through the door they came in because people might be coming in. And if they see people leaving, then it's kind of like a negative kind of signal. Like, oh, why are these people leaving? I'm just walking into the club. Why are people leaving already? Right. These are very tactical, but no, but those are important. So that's the flow of a space as well. Totally everything. It's the flow. Yeah. Exploration, discovery, spontaneity, all these pieces. And so what's really interesting is when we started finding ourselves in other verticals that had nothing to do with nightlife and the fun and learning that we're directing the exact same learnings into healthcare. Right. Or into airports. Yes. And it's like, oh my God. So yeah, we're not doing design architecture here. We're doing something completely different. We're extracting important lessons about how we as people find ourselves in public spaces outside of our home, which we don't work in, right? And we're creating memories for people that are coalescing around place, Right. And so, and for me, that's like, oh, and by the way, it wasn't until I got a phone call from Sloan Kettering. I was like, my God, how, how did I not see this? How did they see something in us that we didn't understand about ourselves that they would call us? And it was so obvious once we started working with them that we had a lot to offer to that world. Absolutely. And it just, it goes to show your initial thesis that architecture had sort of splintered off into all these different separate factions is undermining the whole system because those concepts that you deployed, those skills that you perfected in terms of understanding human anxiety and how to solve for that in a space transfers to any space. Right. Any space. And airports and healthcare, those are some of the most anxious spaces we ever exist in. So that's even more crucial and meaningful in those places. That's when we're displaced. That's when we're we're worried. That's exactly right. And that's how they got to us. I understood from an article, quite frankly, that we designed places of anxiety. And they're like, well, there's nowhere more anxious than a cancer hospital, so let's call these guys. Wow. And if you want to talk about brave, when I say ideas for the brave, who's braver than Sloan Kettering that hired essentially a hospitality design firm to do a cancer hospital? That's wow. like, right? Like we had. That is brave. That's brave. What was that like for you? Did that feel profound? It was profound. First of all, I lost my father to cancer, so that was already a big thing. I think also it was an affirmation. Like we were, we're we're not, we don't ever really fit like a proper peg in interior design or architecture or experience. Like there was no experience design. Experience design didn't really exist as a discipline, really in and of itself strategists. There's all these parts swirling around. We still have a hard time defining what we do. Like, where do you call us for? When do you call us? All these questions. So it was very affirming for us and the work felt important. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was, it was really special. So I'm happy you had that experience in part because it says to you, but more importantly, it says to the world that Design can impact so many things, including health outcomes. If you'll consider it, if you'll bring it into the fold, if you'll let the designers and the architects at the table from an early point in the project, 
you can attack the problem from all of these different angles and solve for things that you might not even think could be improved by design. Well, I think I think that's true. And I think this is where we are today. Like you have to expand what it, what do you mean by design? Exactly. What do you do you mean like what materials we're picking or the quality of light, all of the above, which I think they all they're all they all play a role in it. For example, in our research, we learned that people who are inspired have better outcomes. If you find out, you know, God forbid you have cancer and you go in, in it with a try me attitude as opposed to a why me attitude, you legitimately have a better chance of surviving because your head's kind of like prepared for the challenge and you're going to like suit up and get ready for this challenge. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, that's the basis of everything we're going to do here, right? Like we are going to challenge ourselves to figure out if we can create a facility, right? That's an active participant in your cure. We don't do the medicine, so that's outside of our purview. But everything else, everything else is like, we're going to tackle that. Yeah, but it is. I do absolutely 100% believe that our surroundings, our environment, our space has everything to do with our wellness. And I agree with you, like expanding our definition of design. When I think of design, I think of it really as a framework for achieving outcomes. And you just it's about inputs and having enough experience to kind of anticipate what might be built and then having enough critical thinking to anticipate unintended outcomes. Yeah. And I think, I think like, if you think about that, we have a mantra that says that the experience is the brand. Yes. I love your mantras, man. man we we yeah. give good mantra. <laughs> so for us, it's like, what do you, when you say, what do you mean that by design? Like, well, how do you, Find out that you should be at Sloan Kettering. What is that experience about? When you arrive, what is that first moment all about? Right? When you leave, you just went through cancer treatment. What's leaving all about? Do you ever leave? Are you part of a, a family now? And there's some sort of communication or some experience. Do you pay it forward for people who are coming in after that they can be inspired? So all these kind of parts are like, you know, we put RTLS technology on the patients, right? So real-time location service, so like RFID. Part of our physical digital thing is like half of the time you're just anxious because you want to know if your loved one is at a surgery and you don't know, you're trying to find someone and like be patient, doctor hasn't come out yet. And that's just ratcheting up the anxiety level. Right. So for us, we're like, well, forget what it looks like. How do we bring that anxiety level down? And so by putting an RTLS device on the patient, you can now track where they are, right? So it's like patient 13502 is in recovery, right? Right. So by the time we did our second hospital, which was a radiation infusion and chemo center, David H. Koch Center on 74th Street, do you have people coming like for chemo or radiation or infusion? They might be signed up for a year or more, a few oh times God. a week, right? It's, it felt a whole lot more like enrolling into college. Like, it's your campus. This is your campus for life. Like, well, this is a whole different relationship. And so we were like, well, how do we change the paradigm from people being like, I never want to see that color green again, or I never want to smell that pine salt any cleaner they use in the hallways, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. You know, and so, and so it came to us to, to sort of turn this thing upside down. Look, nobody wants to have cancer. There's a lot of things people don't want, but because they went through it, they learn so much about themselves or they're o able to open doors that otherwise wouldn't have been open. Now, cancer takes all the control away from you, right? What you can eat, where you can sleep, can you work, can you do this, can you do that, what you look like, it's like you lose all control. So just giving control back to people, right? It was like, okay, can we let them choose the music they want to hear? sit in an environment that suits their emotion that day, manipulate the color of the lighting, right? Be in a class, learn something, watch TV, just veg out like a couch potato, right? All these different things that are just like giving you even a minute amount of choice back, right? That we knew we're, we're going to, to- reconnect with your own humanity to- Yeah, just to be like, I'm, I'm still a person, right? I'm still a mom, still a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. But then there was this other part of it, with, which was like, well, what if this door did open up for you? Usually people don't get this door. Like, what would you do to fill that time? 
Would it be like, well, I'm finally going to learn French or I'm going to like learn Photoshop and make an album for all my grandchildren or I'm going to write a book or I'm going to fill the blanks. So we were like, can we facilitate that open window to actually be this positive thing? And we thought that if you can't look at it as like, if it weren't for me going through this, I would never have done that, right? Yeah. And facilitate the opportunity for people to engage in those kinds of things. You are going to inspire people. They are going to be focused on the book they want to write, the language they want to learn. Not only that, but you're fostering hope. Like they're having incremental progress in a new skill, which means they're looking forward to the next step and the next day, and they're planning to live. Like, Correct. This is important work. I'm glad so, you're doing it. So, like, that's what I mean about, like, what is design, right? So, you know, it's like, yeah, it's it's a lot of, it's like, how far do you want to take it? And then, and then go back to the beginning of our conversation is like, what do we actually have agency, right? To which parts of the project belong to you when you sit at the table to talk with a client about what it is that you do? Right. In that question, what parts of the project do you have agency over? How do you navigate that? Do you sometimes buy more space for yourself? I do. I'm constantly buying more space for myself. As a matter of fact, I'm moving further and further and further earlier into the process. For me, if the project's baked, it's too late for me. It might not be for my company, but for me personally, at this stage of my career, I want to be there when we're trying to understand the why and help form the why of any project, right? Yes, I understand that completely. And I'm wondering, were you there for the why on the sphere? No, definitely not. That was, uh, you give J- Jim Dolan total credit for that one. Okay. We were there for the why of the experience of the sphere. Okay. But why sphere exists, he completely had a vision and said, I want to have this spherical thing and I want to do A, B, C, and D. When we were brought to the project, there was still a ton of room to figure out, well, okay, so is this a stadium? Is this a arena? Is it a concert hall? What is the, the experience? What is it going to feel like when you arrive here? What world does this posit for you? We were really focused on the physicality, like where and what, how do you arrive? What's your emotional response when you enter there, right? And and what kind of world can we build? So for us, I think that when it clicked, when I went there, and you know, there still was no roof on it, and we kind of like, understood the scale and what the client, what the customer would be going through when they arrived and how vast this thing was going to be. Have you been yet? No, I'm dying to go. Yeah. It's to their credit at MSG and Jim specifically, they really, he really has kind of reinvented the way that one can, ex- one can experience a live show. And Bono said it on stage opening night. He said, this is solving the problem that arose in Shea stadium when the Beatles played in whatever it was, 1964, it was the first time that someone had like done a big live performance with sound speakers, right? And apparently at that show at Shea Stadium, you couldn't hear the band because there probably weren't enough speakers for that many people ever designed yet. And the band couldn't hear themselves at all. Oh, right. Yeah, this is this is legendary. Yeah, and, for, and from that moment until this, nobody had just designed a place specifically for listening to music, right? Or for or seeing a big show. No, right. There were these big venues that were repurposed for other things, yeah. And so it did sort of put a stake in the ground. And we were like, okay, well, what does it mean to, to arrive here? Where, where are you? You know, and, and that really was the genesis of this idea that we saw the sphere as like, the proscenium moving to the skin. Like as soon as you cross that kind of skin of what that sphere is, you were mm-hmm. inside the show, right? What we're hoping to do is that erase that line between spectator and spectacle, right? Like you are now part of the spectacle inside this world. And so we wanted people to feel like they were step through the looking glass as one of our original kind of mantra, step what, you know, stepping through the looking glass and, and be the spectator right? Erase that line. The stage is everywhere and you are part of the stage. Wow. So having done this, you've made a name for yourself. You'll be doing more of these, but I also understand that you're continuing to do a lot of award-winning work in the restaurant space. And I think of it as a really, 
important space for communities, but also for society. And so I wonder if you can talk to me about some of your restaurant work and maybe how that's moving, like what direction you feel you're evolving in, in terms of that? Yeah, sure. When we got a call to do a restaurant on the extension of the MoMA, at the base of the MoMA, I think for me, it was an important time for me to understand. I crave, I don't know if it was 20 years old yet, but it was right around there. And at this point, I'd lost the kind of immediacy of working on a project. It had been a long, long time Mm -hmm. since I had a project that I could just completely say, I did that project. You know what I mean? I have directors. Directors have teams. I kind of do this executive creative direction oversight and client relations and stuff. But I'd stopped doing the reason why I'd been the designer my whole life, which is actually design something. I just kind of wanted to do it, right? It was at the moment. It was a really cool opportunity. And I really, really wanted to make sure I was all over it. For the first time in many years, I took like a direct, direct role in being the lead on a project and really thinking through things that, again, that I want to, uh, that I was struggling with, right? And I think like in general, what I call the Brooklynification of Manhattan had been going on for a long time where everything needed to look like it'd been there forever. And it was like the bespoke bent wood with a piece of copper on it, you know, just like, yeah. Okay. I feel like design had moved into a Pinteresty. This is what restaurants look like kind of thing. And so I was like, well, what does it mean? What do I have to say today about a restaurant? And so we kind of like, I kind of like really focused on the sculptural quality, like this idea that you were dining in a sculpture, that this thing was not, just a, a a room for eating, but as an extension of where it lived, that it was part of the narrative of what MoMA actually is. And at the core of all that, there was also just this idea that I love a yummy room. And everyone was like, well, what's a yummy room? I'm like, you know a yummy room when you're in it, right? Yeah, it's sensuous. The lighting is good. It's like- The lighting's perfect. You can hear the people at your table. Yes, right? you can hear them. You might hear the clank of a wine glass. You know, just like the right sounds pop out, but not the cacophony of like people laughing and cackling and all sorts of things. Or the din of just everything sort of on top of each other so that you can't distinguish anything. Yeah. Right. Or you feel like you're in like a ripped out page of a travel magazine because it's just got to look a certain way to get that perfect Instagram shot. And we just were like, let's not be that. Let's figure out how to create this yummy room. It's a timelessness. A place that you say, where do you want to go? You know you want to go there because you want that kind of intimacy of space with friends, right? And where the light emerges from the center of the table and everyone's lit like around the fire and whatnot. So these kind of like things were like super important. Oh, and by the way, it wants to be a sculpture that you're living in inside the <laughs> MoMA kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's it. That's so, all. So uh, it was, it was, it was very cathartic for me. It was super important for me. Once I realized that I still can do this and it can work and I can get like, I want to design, I want to draw, I want to paint. There's things I want to do that I'm not doing because I'm running a business. Right. Oh man. And that's just taking time away from me doing what I not only want to do, but should be doing is a contributing into the world and into I want my kids to see me actively doing interesting things, right? It's not running a business. And and I think that the time came in, in a kind of serendipitous way for for me to sort of look at where's I crave go from here. And how do you do that with integrity, right? And not be like, hey, I crave designs, you know, metaverse now. Like we now do this. It's like I used to say I crave will be the company it's supposed to be when we look at our competitors and we go, let him design that. He's better at that than we are because you're not just so desperate to get the interior design fee because you need it because you're running a business. You've actually stepped outside of that and you're kind of like looking at it in a much more strategic position with the client. And that takes maturity and that takes kind of like confidence in what you do, not to just want to do everything. That also saves you from kind of spending your energy and your steam on a project that doesn't really fulfill you or your team. You got that right. And the team's so important. They want to be working on things that mean something to them. Because if they've also made a lot of sacrifices to be in this profession, and that's about passion, and it's about drive, and it's about integrity, and all those things. And you can't just jam things down. Not at iCrave, we don't want to jam things down people's throats, because we have to do it. 
But, you know, like I've always wondered what iCrave would look like or what company would you build if you had to build it today? And that's where Journey was born, right? Journey was born. Oh, I was introduced to somebody who was a former CEO of Frog design firm. Okay, yep. And we've known each other for at least 10 years now. And we've been bouncing around the idea of what a company would look like. What do we do? You know, how can we reinvent the way creatives get remunerated for their work? You know, this fee system sucks and these people aren't making enough money and we should own part of the equity and all these kinds of things, which I've done a lot, by the way. In my career, I've owned a lot of the projects that I've designed. Again, that that affords you more opportunity to be as true to the creative process that you want to be because you're not counting on every dollar that comes in being a dollar from your design fee. So we've always thought like, there's got to be a way to change this. Mm -hmm. gonna, these creatives are so, they, they add so much to the process. They add so much to these projects, right? And at the end of the day, they just, they just it's very hard to get the pay structure across a, a creative studio that, that you'd like to because it's just the revenue's not there. Plus it's fundamentally misaligned with the, the human output of the endeavor. Don't you think? Like oh, if, it's, it's just wrong. It's just, it's wrong. If you're just paying me for my service and I'm putting in all of this energy to sort of imagine what could be built for you on behalf of your brand and how it's going to function for you and your, your customers. And then when it's designed and I'm not getting paid anymore, I've just been squeezed dry for this thing that continues to serve you and your brand forever and ever and potentially grows your brand not just your bottom line, but your cachet and all of that. Yeah. Well, look, I'll, t I'll say it this way. People will always exploit passion. I get to do something that a lot of people don't get to do. I get to wake up every day and do what I love every day. Right? I get to like think about ideas. I get to like go from something in my head, put it down on paper, be part of the process while it gets built, and then actually see people use it. That is a gift. That's a tremendous gift that, that resonates deeply to, to understand what a life is all about. Right. And if, if you, it's, it's, it's a really sad thing. Like they know that there's passion in it. Right. And so it's sad. It's, that's what bothers me the most about it. It's like, forget the hard work. If you just understood how much passion people are putting forward, how much of themselves they're putting forward to solve this problem for you, you know, would you rethink it? One of the things that's so like really arresting about that, it's making me really uncomfortable, is this idea is, of passion being extracted as opposed to understanding that if you contribute and reciprocate the passion, then it's generative and that everybody wins. And so it's almost like, a fossil fuel, you know, like if people continue to exploit the passion of passionate individuals, it does not serve humanity, <laughs> including the person who's doing the exploiting. You're right. And we do not live in a world that's set up today for people to be passionate. They're better off being, to being the opposite. They're better off being callous because everything is a get rich fast scheme or some sort of evidence that you could do nothing to make a lot. Like every, it's just, it's a different culture. It's different. That's a, listen, I'm scared because I have kids, you know? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Like as of, as in your parental fatherly role, like, do you want your kids to see you passionate or do you want your kids to see you safe? I think my my kids are safe with me being passionate because that's who I am. And I, I'm more concerned about if they find their passion, that's my job right now. I have two jobs with my kids, right? Is to teach them who they are and make sure they have a strong core. You know, they can weeble wobble all day, but they're going to come back to their core. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's critically important. And the second is to help them find their passion and have the confidence to stay in that passion and manifest a life along that passion. The problem is and if you live in a world where like it gets sucked out of anybody with passion and, and and people do they know when they've found somebody with passion and they they bridle up next to you. Yeah, it's true. I tell young people all the time, do not be 
frivolous with your time because these people will waste your time. People, when people leave and say, Hey, I want to start my own business. I'm like, all right, let's sit down and have a talk. I think you should. It's a good time for you to start your business. Right. But here's the things you need to know. I love to hear your parenting perspective because I think it resonated really deeply with me as a human. I I think your kids (laughs) are in a good spot with you. I hope so. It's definitely my most important work. (laughs) <laughs> I'll tell you, it's really interesting. I was at Burning Man, which you probably know I've been going for many, many years. I did read about that, yes. I know. It was just after Larry Harvey died who started Burning Man. And somebody said to me at this event, what are you going to do for Larry? And I thought about it for a couple of days, and I hand out these kind of Little Prince pop-up books as a gift that I hand out to people. Little Prince is an important book to me. And so I'll put notes in there or whatever, and I hand it out to people. And so I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm going to like write down some of my inner thoughts, right? Like I'm just going to start writing them down. And then on the night of the burn, the when they burn the temple, I'll dedicate it to Larry and I'll put it in there and it'll burn with the, the temple. And, you know, that'll be my kind of like tribute to him. And so I started writing... It took me a long time, a lot of procrastinating, a lot of procrastinating, and I started writing, and I I realized that I was just like, I was just dropping ideas and stuff that have been with me forever, right? And it's like, if you ever this, then always remember that. And like, you know, I'm going through in the, and I'm writing in the margins of the book, so the book's now like this codex kind of thing, it's getting thicker. And my wife comes back into the RV, and I'm like, I'm not burning this book. (laughs) <laughs> I'm giving this book to my kids. Are we crazy? I was like, could you imagine if your dad or your mother gave you a book like this? And so I think it's important to, with kids, the idea of raising exceptional children isn't that they might be the president of the United States or the CEO of a company, right? It's about, you have to define what that means to you, right? Every parent should have like a, a clear idea of what the project of raising their kids is, Right. It's the most important project of your life. You're like, well, what does exceptional mean? Because that's the only reason we're here. That's the only reason we have kids because we want to make a better world. Well, maybe that's not what everyone thinks. That's what I think. And so that exceptionalism probably lays in empathy, right? And it probably lays in in strength of self and 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 having like a point of view that's based on some sort of ideals that are fair and valuable, right? Without overburdening your children with your own precepts. And so for me, like one of the things that I've always recognized, especially as a Jew and being challenged as a Jew a lot, is knowing who you are, knowing what virtues are important to you and what you believe is right and wrong and understanding why you believe that. It's not dogma. And so for me, like this idea of like being able to resist this current trend of like humbleweed egos, like you just can you can't say anything to anybody because if you dare say anything that will hurt anyone's feelings that we haven't provo- we haven't like fortified you know these kids with enough sense of who they are to just be able to say yeah that does offend me but i understand your point of view and let's have a conversation about it right like that to me is so frightening if you're offended that is the pinnacle of what is a- an affront to you right and i think that you know i already see it with my daughter She's like really upset with me because I hurt her feelings. She just turned eight, right? And she was really mad about it. I was like, Charlie, I'm going to hurt your feelings a lot, right? Like my job here is to challenge your feelings. And I, I gave her her first mantra. I said, your feelings don't control you. You control your feelings. Yeah. This is your mantra. It was like, you are not formed by your feelings. You need to be able to like have your central core strong. You need to be able to understand who you are and that you're not the summary of all things that happened to you. You know what I mean? And and I think like it's it, it, I could see it happens at an early age. Like they are like, hey, those are my feelings. Now your feelings are important and you should you should be able to understand that your feelings feel a certain way. You should be able to react to them. But they're not the pinnacle of like why you exist, right? We have to we have to confront those things. And so and so for me, like I think it's indicative of like you need to have a sense of like your core and where it comes from and what your history is and why you are 
a makeup of all these different things, right? And what the world has offered you. My, I didn't grow up like my kids. I think my kids are growing up much more affluent than I am. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, what do they need to know that I had to deal with or that where we came from? Right. So that it's part of who they are. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting at that young age, like the the concept of feelings and also learning to honor your feelings, but not let them control you. Learning to not take things personally or define you or internalize them and let them inform your sense of self. Like that's that's kind of a difficult abstract concept, especially when feelings are flooding your system. But I understand what you're saying in terms of helping guide that shaping, that process in terms of learning to understand where you are in relationship to your feelings, understanding who you are in relationship to what happens in an external fashion in terms of what people say or what happens to you. I think that's a little bit of what we were talking about earlier, about being able to stand next to your ego, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I never thought of that before, but I think listening to you, I think like, yeah, like, okay, this is how I feel. Why do I feel that way? And could I feel differently if I thought about it differently? If I reframed it for myself? What's making me feel that way? Is that my ego or is that something that I really like? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that... I just really pray that we're able to step through this moment right now to kind of like, I mean, the world is kind of vibrating at such a bizarre pitch right now in so many fronts. Like, I I think there's a purpose missing, right? And all these things that are happening all over the place are just indicative of like a lack of kind of like vision or purpose about where we want to actually go. We're just always getting bounced around from one thing to another. It's frightening. It is frightening. I do sometimes just derive a lot of hope from my students. Sometimes the next generation just astounds me with their clarity and sense of purpose. And it gives me a lot of encouragement. That's amazing to hear. I'm really happy to hear that. You are a profound man, Lionel. I've enjoyed every second of this and I feel completely enriched from having shared this time with you. Thank you so much. Well, so do I. Thank you so much for this time. It's been great. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Lionel, including links and images of his work, head to our website, cleverpodcast.com. While you're there, check out our resources page for books, info, and special offers from our guests, partners, and sponsors. And sign up for our free Substack newsletter. If you like Clever, there are a number of ways you can support us. Share Clever with your friends, Leave us a five-star rating or a kind review, support our sponsors, and hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app so that our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and X. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Mark Zurawinski, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows. You know you'll be room when you're in it, right?